Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. So glad you came to worship with us. Hope you got your snacks and breakfast. If you didn't bring anything with you, we always have some around. Uh, because we're Baptists, it's just part of who we are. Instead of, you know, denying it, we just embrace it. Um, but no, we appreciate that. So good to have everyone out there this morning. Let me tell you about a, a couple of things. First off, um, if you have a prayer request of any kind for you or for someone else, there should be some prayer forms in the pew in front of you. Or you can go on our website or you can just email it at frostbaptist at gmail.com. There's also a QR code if you just want to scan that with your telephone. It'll take you right there. Telephone, I am old with your cell phone. Uh, it'll take you right to our, our uh, form to fill out our prayer request. Our prayer team meets on Wednesday nights. We'd love to pray about these things, whatever's going on in your life or someone else's. If you have any updates on prayer requests that you've given or any praises for things that God has answered, we'd love to know about that too. So feel free to put that in. We'd love to have that. I want to say thank you to everyone who helped with the fifth quarter Friday night. Game didn't go quite like we wanted, although they did look good. So we're proud of our guys. Um, but we had a good time at the fifth quarter. Uh, had a lot of uh, students here, a lot of fun. A few spills, but we had a lot of fun. That was good. Uh, if you helped Friday night, could you just raise your hands? So if you help, uh, some of you guys aren't right there. They're all home sleeping. They're not here. So uh, I will say this. I don't know if she's back there. But um, we always think, oh, and we say this, that God can use anybody and everybody in ministry. Ministry, we always, two people say, oh, ministry is hard. And, and it is hard in a way. But sometimes we make it too hard. Ministry can be easy, too. Um, our youngest helper that night was a kindergartner. Bristol Ketchum was helping me. She helped me do the time on one of the games I was doing, okay? She's in kindergarten. So we have no excuses about how much we know and about how prepared we are or anything like that. Kindergartners are helping us out, okay? God can use anybody at any time. The difference is, are we there and available for him to use us? And that's what makes a difference. So uh, Crystal was there. She hung out with us and, and played, and she just came over and Ran the clock for me, so she did great with us. I appreciate that. I appreciate all the people who came and helped out with that, too. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get down to our service. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to gather together, Lord. Father, thank you for the reason to gather together that you have given us your son, Jesus, who died in our place at the cross of Calvary for our sins, that we would have eternal life with you. And Father, thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit. Father, your indwelling presence that we have access to you all the time. And Father, you would never leave us nor forsake us. And Father, today, as we go into this time of worship, I pray, Lord, you would just speak to everyone in here. Father, you know every heart and mind in here. You know every family. You know every problem, every worry, every fear. And Father, every distraction that we have in our life. But Father, I pray for just a little while, Father, we could focus on you, that we could hear your voice. And Father, I pray for lives to be changed for an eternity. Father, I pray for believers to grow closer to you. And I pray for the people of God to be used to glorify your kingdom. Thank you again for your love and your grace. And it's in your name we pray, Father. Amen. 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 All right. Stand up and worship with us this morning. If you're able, please stand with We're going to sing a fast song this morning, start now. So get your energy up if you want to run around or something. Be a bit calm, okay? Well, here we go.
Glorious day. 
and bring us a word. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, this time our children are dismissed to Children's Church. We're going to make a few adjustments to the stage up here. Yes, don't try this at home. Always go to a friend's house first. <laughs> you tell my childhood when did <laughs> We are still uh, uh, in the midst of before we start our new series. I wanted to kind of to do a couple of standalones. Last week we talked about what tithing is and what the biblical teaching of that is. <clears throat> some people know it, some people don't. So we just want to always make sure that we're teaching what God's Word says. So today I want to cover this this issue that is major important in everything that we believe. It literally is a difference in life and death. And it is about the belief in God. Now, I did this during VBS, and I did it, and I told the kids about being on a bus. And I said, just imagine you're getting on the school bus, and uh, we're going to pretend that this is God's bus up here. And I'm going to use that again today, except my wife said, don't do it like a kid version. <laughs> You guys are so blessed to have her at home checking me before I get up here. That's all I, you don't know how blessed you are to have her. So, so I'm going to do it more like an adult one, okay? So we're going to take a trip, all right? We're going to take a journey because life is a journey. And we're going to take this journey through the book of Romans, but primarily we're going to stop in Romans chapter 10. Now, again, this is major important. It's everything. It makes a difference in everything because I said last week, well, we're not a club, we're not an, a, a social organization, we're not a, a charity or any of those things, although we have some of the same aspects of all of those. We are something completely different. We are the body of Christ. We are a gathering of believers that God has placed here, and that sets us apart from the world completely. And the difference is Jesus. Amen. So... Uh, so we're going to look at this, this message of the three C's. I call them the three C's. It's confess, claim, and commit. Okay, and we'll get to those in just a second. If you can get them all written down, so we'll have that for you. Okay? Um, lots of things that you hear in the world. And a lot of people ask, well, you know, is there only really one way to have stuff like that? Listen, there's a lot of roads in this world. Uh, we were talking earlier about driving through cities. And there's a lot of places you can go. And everybody's going somewhere Everybody's traveling somewhere. Everybody has a different destination. But in the end, we hope we get to the spot we really want to be at, which is heaven. I have yet to meet anybody that said, I really hope I make it to hell one day. Everybody wants to make it to heaven. Everybody wants to be there, probably for different reasons. But we all have that one place and the Bible says there's only one way to get there now again I'm not just telling you what I believe and what I say I'm telling you what God's word says Amen. it says there's only one way so we have all these different places that we can go and we see people going a lot of different ways but there's only one way that will actually get there imagine if you will you're on a bus and you're in traffic up in Dallas or down in Houston or Austin or San Antonio or somewhere. And there's cars everywhere and they're driving around on all these roads. You're going somewhere. So what makes your journey different than any of theirs? The destination. Where you really are hoping to get to. 
And imagine, if you will, uh, that this is our bus, and I, I really started to, to make a background for it, but that was way too much work than I've got in me, because uh, I had fifth quarter and other stuff. So, uh, but uh, we're just going to do the chair. So, the first question we ask is, why God? Why would we even care about this God? Now, there was a day when no one would have asked that. It was automatically assumed that everybody believed there is a God, and that one day we will stand before Him. Those days are over. Maybe they'll come again for our children or grandchildren, but for this generation, those days are over. Everybody's asking this, why God? What makes a difference between God and Allah and Muhammad and Buddha and anybody else like that? Why God? Well, first off, let me just set the basis for you. Romans 18, uh, 1, starting in verse 18. This is what it tells us. For the wrath of God is revealed from the heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. In other words, part of their unrighteousness is that they ignore the truth and suppress it. For what can, can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. In other words, all of creation has shown that there is a God. All of creation proves that there is something out there, something uh, that's above us and bigger than us, so everybody is without excuse to believe that there's something out there. There was a professor from Dartmouth University, one of the Ivy League schools, and he said, I'm an agnostic. He said, but I will have to say, you're a fool if you say there's no such thing as intelligent design. He would not claim to be a Christian or a believer, but he said, even I know there's something out there bigger than us. God is the creator. He started all this. So if he started all this, and he's probably in control of all of it. I'm going to read this to you. You don't have to flip there. Actually, I have it for you, so I just remember this. Uh, Revelations. We talked about the kingdom. Everybody has a kingdom. And in your VBS, we talked about the kingdom of David and, and all the other kingdoms they had. And the thing to remember about God's kingdom is it's the only eternal one. Everybody has a kingdom. Just like I said, we're on the road and we have all these cars and everybody's driving at different speeds and going different places. And some of their cars look way cooler than your bus. And all, some of those cars are going way faster than your bus is going. And some of those cars, the people look way cooler than the people on your bus. Well, what makes yours difference is the kingdom of God that it's representing. Uh, Revelation 17, 14. They make war on the Lamb. This is talking about end times, of course. And the Lamb will conquer them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with Him are called chosen and faithful. And then a couple of chapters over, chapter 19, he says this. When he returns, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. There are a lot of kingdoms in this world. A lot of powers. But what's the one that's the eternal one? That's above and beyond all of those. Exactly where is your destination one to take you? And where do you think you're going to end up? And how do you think you're going to get there? Well, we've got the Creator, we've got the Kingdom, but then we've got to go with Christ Himself. John 14, 6 says that uh, there is no one else that, that God has put in charge. It says that no man comes to the Father except through me, Christ talking about Himself. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. So here's... Imagine this. My kids are now in college and they have parking garages and they have parking lots and things like that and gates down and you have to have this tag to get in there. And it never fails. And when I go down there, they'll say, turn down this road, Dad, to see if the gate's open. And I'll say, what if it's not? Oh, we'll have to back up. You want to tell all the people behind me that I'm going to back up? I want to know before we get there, okay? But we have to have this special tag that when we get there that opens the gate. We have that, and the only thing is, it's Jesus Christ. So the only driver of this bus who has the keys, who can drive this bus, who can get it to that destination, is Jesus Christ Himself. Amen. 
That's the only way. Yes, there are a lot of other cars on the road going different places and all the different roads, but only Christ is the way to heaven. That's it. Only Christ is the way to God. Okay? Uh, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you have ever asked the question, are there other ways to God? No. Are there many ways to Christ? There are a lot of different churches you can go to and a lot of different ways people come to know Christ. But past that point, there's no other way. Some people come to Christ because they were reading the Bible and went, whoa, I understand this. Some people were sitting on a bus one day and someone shared the gospel with them and they said, wow, I understand. Somebody was in a Sunday school class maybe or a vacation Bible school and they heard the teacher and they were like, oh, I get that. I need Christ. However you got to Christ is different ways, but past that there's only one way to God, His Son Jesus. Again, not just my words, this is what God is saying in His Word, okay? So, the next thing we have is confess, okay? Uh, Romans 3.23. This is, by the way, I forgot to put this in, that would have been better. This is called the Roman road. Get it? Or bus? A road? I'll get it later. Don't worry. <laughs> Romans 3.23 tells us this. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace and a gift to the redemption that is Christ Jesus. Everybody has sinned. Everybody in here. Now when I did this for the kids... I was a little cautious, but I did it anyhow. I said, hey, this is a great bus. This is the bus that's going to take us to God. It's God's bus. Who wants to be on it? Who wants to guess how many kids raised their hands? All of them. The whole room. Yeah, yeah. And I said, that's awesome. There's only one thing. Before you can get on God's bus, you have to be perfect. Some of your kids still claim they're perfect, by the way. I'm just going to tell you that. I didn't want to crush their little spirits, but I had to tell them, no, you're really not. <laughs> All right. Hopefully some of you realize you're probably not perfect. Amen. The only way to get on this bus that takes you to heaven is if you are holy and righteous before God. It says that we have fallen short of God's glory. Not the people sitting beside of you. Because you're probably better than some of them. Some of you are not. But some of you may be. A lot of you are better than I am. That's pretty easy. So that bar set pretty low. But none of us in this room are going to measure up to God's glory. And that is what makes this possible. So here we are in our lives. As far as God sees us. This is how we walk around. Can't deny it. We can try to deny it. Act like it's not there. Maybe we can walk a different way so nobody will notice. <clears throat> Truth is, it's still there. And God still sees it. In 1 John 1, 9, John writes to a church, and he's writing to believers, and he tells them this. I think I have it up there. I'm sure. Yeah. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I want to point out a couple of words here. The first one is this word confess right there. We know how confess works. And I'm, I've shared this before, but I want to say it again because I want to make sure we get it covered. Confess is not when we come into a room and explain what happened because nobody knows. Who broke this? Who spilled this? We don't know, but we know something happened, so we need somebody to own up to it. That's what we think of as confessing. That's not. This word literally means to agree with. So the idea is that God comes to me and says, Jason, you have sin in your life. And at that moment, I can agree with God and say, yes, Lord, I know I see it. Or I can deny it and say, no, I don't. It's not me. You should look at these other people if you really want to see sin. I'll give you names to start with, Lord. 
And that's what makes the difference in when God comes to us and what the confession is. And this other word I want to bring up is this word cleanse. Don't confuse that with the word clean. Okay? This is a Greek word. It's karithasai. It's where we get our word catharsis. This, this internal, complete healing and cleaning. And the ideal here is purified. Some of your Bibles may actually have that word. I prefer it. It's when we come to this bus and we say, okay, we need to clean this bus. All they're going to do is sweep it out and pick up some of the trash, make sure there's no kids left on it, things like that. There, it's clean. We're good. But what if we went to them and said, listen, this bus has to be purified. If you've ever ridden on a school bus or a city bus, you're going, yeah, that's not happening. You might as well burn that down and build a new one. <laughs> We can't just sweep stuff out and hide it anymore. God says, no, you bring it all to me because we're going to purify this. There's going to be nothing left unholy in there. This is what confession does. When we agree with God, then he can work in our lives. It tells us this. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. There we go. Sorry. But God shows his love for us that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Did you catch that? While we were still yet sinners, before we did all the good stuff, before we did anything right, before we, we went to church and before we were acting really good, and before we gave a tithe and did any of that stuff, Christ died for us. Because we were sinners and he knew we would need it. And he took care of it. And this is what his death does for us. The Bible says that we are a new creation. A new creature. Christ's blood actually covers our sin. So that when God sees us, this is what he's going to see in us. If I don't mess it up here. This is how we appear to God. Yes, he sees our face, but he sees the blood of his son covering our sin. Now, there are going to be a lot of people in your life, remind you, we know there's still sin under there. As a matter of fact, some of you are probably even looking closely to see if the sin is showing up through the light. I can still see it in your life. Well, let me give you some bad news. You don't count. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 27 says, I will stand before God on judgment day. So if he says, Jason, I have placed your sin as far away as the east is from the west, then all the stuff you bring to me doesn't count anymore. I would appreciate if people would be encouraging and tell me your sins have been covered, Jason. You're a new creation. You walk in a different way now. Yeah, we know that sin was there. But that's not how we see you either. But there are still those who are going to say, No, we remember. We know. And we're still looking for it in your life. Well, okay, you be that way. But the important part is, that's not what Christ did. Christ said, Yeah, I see your sin. And I'm paying for it. So that when you show up to my Father... You get on this bus. This is what I see. The Bible says that we will be made as white as snow. That all the sin will be removed. So Christ. Uh oh, now I'm in trouble. There we go. Christ covers our sin, so we no longer deal with that. He has dealt with it for us. And that is done by grace. Grace. You have three words that you need to learn in life. Judgment, mercy, and grace. Judgment is receiving what you deserve. That was judgment. You did it, you deserve it. Mercy is not receiving what you deserve. You did it, but you don't get the punishment. Grace is receiving what you did not deserve. You didn't earn this. You weren't good enough for it, but you got it anyhow. And 
Christ covered our judgment through his mercy and his grace. That's how Christ works. That is the only way we have access to get on the bus. The only way that we have access to Christ, who is the only way to get to God. In other words, the only way to get to the bus that will take you to heaven is through Christ. Okay? Now, here's the claim part. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, which is our, our verse we're going to. says this, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. If you want to know how to be saved, here it is, black and white. First thing is, it says we believe. First step is confess that we are sinners, and now we're getting to the claim that the first step is to believe. And what is it that we believe? Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, why is it that it didn't list a whole bunch of other things that we want to list a lot of times? Why doesn't it say, if you believe you should run in church? If you believe that you should always come to Sunday school? If you believe that the Bible should be left in the middle of the coffee table and never have glasses set on it or anything. Why doesn't it have all these other things that we tend to put out there to know that someone is saved? Because God says this, listen. If you believe that I raised Jesus from the dead because he was truly my son, then you believe that he really died to pay for your sins. And you believe he died because you believe he really hung on the cross and shed his blood for what you and I did and not what he did. Amen. It covers everything else once you get to that point. If you believe this bus will get you there, then you're going to believe in the driver who is driving it. You're going to believe in the builder who put it together. All you know is you just got on the bus. You're trusting everything else that came before that. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Okay? Confess with your mouth. Again, we're getting that same word. Agree with him. He claims it, and you say, yes, I believe it. He did do it. He died in my place. Not because of what he did, but because of what I did. He died. And there is this moment when we have to say it. Yes, that is the claiming part. There are things in our life when we actually have to say it out loud. If you want to take somebody to the prom, you have to actually ask them. You can't show up to the prom and hope they got the hint because you showed up in a tux or a dress. That doesn't work. You can date somebody for years and hope to marry them, but until somebody asks, it's probably not going to happen. Usually what happens, I will throw this out, is people break up. Because they say, nobody ever asked to go to the next level. And then once you are asked, you're going to have to answer. It's got to be with the mouth. There's actually a time when we say it. Because we can think it all we want. But when we say it, then it's out there. That moment is real now. I remember in college, it was so funny. I was going into a basketball game. And all of a sudden, these girls, about three or four Busted out the gym door. And one of them, she was a freshman, I knew her, and she was just bouncing. And I thought, what in the world is wrong with her? And all of a sudden she goes, oh, oh, oh my goodness. Oh. So I stopped and I said, what are you guys doing? Oh, I just asked this guy if he'd go to one of our sorority things with me. Oh, oh, that was so scary. Really? I thought she was on fire the way she was acting. And I'm not really a merciful person. I really want to be, but I'm just not. So I just looked at her and I said, hey, welcome to our world. <laughs> but there was something about it. When it actually came out of her mouth, she knew she was in it for sure. And by the way, he said yes. I think they had a great time. I don't really know. 
But there was something when it becomes real, when it comes out of your mouth. Yes, there should be a time in your life when you have actually said something to the effect of, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I know you died for me. I need your forgiveness. And I want you to be the Lord of my life. Again, there is no, there's no sinner's prayer in the Bible. We said that forever. I believe that there was probably a pastor one time that said people need something to say. I'll give them something to, some words to put it into action. There is no magic words that you have to say or anything like that. There is just a confessing with the mouth because of what you believe in the heart. And at that moment, you will be saved. That's when it is, happens at that very instant. You are saved. Now, then, once we're on the bus, I told the kids this. I said, are there rules on your bus? And of course, they all said, yeah. And there are rules on any bus that we go to. We drive in our car, there are rules for that. We all have rules. So we have to commit to those rules that once we're on the bus, we no longer live like we used to live. Paul writes this all through his writings. He said, listen, you no longer live as those who don't believe. You no longer live as the Gentiles used to live. You no longer live as those that are in the old ways. All things have become new. We are now a new creation. So therefore, we live a different way when we are riding this bus with God. Yes, all the other cars are doing all kinds of crazy things. You have people who don't use seatbelts. That doesn't mean you can't. You have people who have kids up in their front seat. Maybe they're driving. I don't know. But that doesn't mean you can do it. You have kids who are hanging out the window. And you have all these other things driving through all the lanes. And it's crazy out there. They're going really fast or really slow. And they're not using their blinker. And they're in the wrong lane. And all these other things that we see. That doesn't mean we can live that way. Because of the destination that we're on, because of the commitment that God made to us, and now we have made the commitment that we will be His people, we live by the rules of God. And it will look different than the world. It should. Because if it doesn't, then I would ask why. Romans chapter 12. Paul writing here, and he's going to take us... Continuing on our journey. This is what he writes, starting with verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, only because Christ covered us again, which is your spiritual worship, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern that is the will of, what is the will of God, what is good, and acceptable and perfect. In other words, now that we are believers, we should seek to know the will of God. We should seek to live like people who represent God. We should live in ways that are holy and acceptable to God more than anyone else. We should have lives that are not conformed, but transformed. Let me tell you the difference between transform. We tried to transform this stage into a bus. It's not really a bus. You know that. But when we conform to something, we shape ourselves to match that. For instance, we're going to conform to this chair. We just change our body to match the chair. We just have a different angle. We don't change anything. But yet, if I was going to change into a butterfly like a moth or anything like that, I couldn't just turn my body and act like I have wings. Probably looks more like a chicken right now, doesn't it? You don't have to say yes to us. I'm just kidding. But I'm not transformed. That would be a completely different creature. And he says, you are something new. A new creation. Not just conforming so that you can look the part. You are changed from the inside out. Remember, believe in the heart so that you are different. And that's how you should live. And he goes on. Chapter 14. Now again, I didn't write this. I'm just reading it. 
Verse 23, whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith. Now he's writing here about eating uh, food sacrificed to idols. And he said, listen, you don't want to cause another brother or sister to stumble. So if they have a problem with you eating food that's sacrificed to idols, don't eat it. He said, do you and I know that it's just food and it's not real God and it's a false God? So if you're okay with it, then you eat it. But if it causes someone else to question their belief, then you don't do it. Okay. But he ends it with this. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Ouch. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Whatever we do as believers that was not done in faith is probably not going to glorify God. It's probably not going to promote God. I love the definition that a guy gave our kids at preteen camp a few years ago. He said, let me help you understand, kids, what glorify God means. It means to make Him famous. And we all know what that looks like. Imagine if we spend as much effort trying to make God as famous as we do all the celebrities and athletes and other people that we see all the time. That's glorifying. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Do everything in faith because God has control over my whole life. So therefore, everything I do should reflect Him. Now, again, does that mean you're going to be perfect? No. What happens when you come to those times of imperfection? Do just what God said. Confess your sins. Not to be saved but to continue to strengthen and build the relationship. Do you and your spouse ever fight? Yes. Uh, James Dobson went to a church one time and he shared this and he said, I went to this church and they said, well, we're having this 50th wedding anniversary for this couple. You ought to come. He said, oh, I'd love to. He goes there and they're talking and he said, wow. They said, this couple's been married for 50 years and never had an argument one time. James Dobson said, I thought, they're either lying or that's the most boring marriage you'll ever see in your life. My guess is online, probably. But what happens is you don't have to get remarried again every time you have a dispute. What you do is you go work on that and you have the strengthening of the relationship because you go back to truth. Same thing with God. We don't have to go have Christ die again. Hebrews says He will not die over and over again. But yet there's this relationship that we are now on the bus, not getting kicked off. But he's going to say, sit down and keep your hands inside. So I have to sit down and keep my hands inside. It's called discipline and growth. And that's what we're going to constantly have when we have these infections. Now, I told you last week about baking, about you get all the ingredients and you put them together and you let them kind of simmer for a while or bake or whatever they need to do in the heat. And they, uh, this is how we get our finished products. So I'm going to give you some more ingredients for this one. Okay, the first one is, do you recognize sin? The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the, God, the glory of God. That means you and I as well. Can you ever say that you've recognized that? Because that moment you know you need Jesus. Now, have you ever had a time when you said it? Did you actually confess it? Yes, you have to say it. Now, do you have a life that reflects the beliefs? Oh, yes, I believe it. Oh, yes, I've said it. Then can I go on your Facebook or Instagram account and see it? Is that what we're reflected? By the way, teenagers, let me throw this out to you. <clears throat> it's been true for a few years now. Whenever you go apply for a job, they don't always just look at your resume. They go look at Facebook and Instagram, Snapchat, and all the other stuff to see what you're putting on social media. Uh, those of you out here who are in a uh, hiring process, you correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I know I'm not, but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. They want to see who you really are, not who you say you are. Same thing when the world looks at us. They don't look at who we say we are. They look at who we really are. Do we have beliefs that reflect what we're claiming? There's a big question everybody asks me. What does it mean to be saved? Well, I have an acronym for this. So if you want to write this down, you can. If not, you can go back and get this later. 
S stands for salvation. Do you understand what the Bible says when it says you must be saved? Do you understand how salvation works? And salvation is pretty simple. Christ died in your place and my place because of the sin that we did, not because of what he did. He was truly buried because he died. It says the wages of sin is death, and Christ took that for us. But it also says that he was raised from the dead. Do you believe that? That God would be so powerful that he could overcome sin and death that we could have eternal life. Now, the A stands for action. There should be some action that follows this belief. One, you should have confessed it. Again, there's not a special prayer you have to have. Um, I actually heard one pastor say this one time. If you can't tell me the date and the time exactly when you said it, and it's not real, that is not in Scripture. But I think you could probably tell me some of the events around there about when it was. Okay? And also, baptism follows that. When they asked Peter, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent, turn away, and be baptized. No, if you do not ever get dunked under the water, you are still saved. However, the question is, why would you not make that public profession of Christ? If you married someone, I can understand if you don't wear a ring because you don't like rings, but would you ever deny that you're married to them? My wife has days like that. She wants to deny she's married to me, and I don't blame her. Uh, but... <laughs> There should be a time when you have confessed Christ, both personally and publicly. Okay? This changes things in our life. First thing it does is it changes our vision. God says that our eyes are open, that we see things now that we've never seen before. You tell me, does things look the same in your life, or do you see things now? God's just opening your eyes. It should start to change. But also the E is enthusiasm. Okay? does not mean that you should be rah, rah, cheerleader all the time because that would annoy all of us after a few minutes, to be honest with you. But there should be some kind of enthusiasm for the things of God. You should want to come to church. You should want to learn about the Bible. You should want to know about prayer. You should want to be a part of a ministry in some way and be serving. You should want to be doing that. And if none of that is appealing to you and none of that gives you any kind of energy, if you don't want any of that thing, then, well, why not? If you were dating or married to someone, you should want to have a relationship with them. You should want to know about them. You should want to spend time with them. Then why in the world would we not have some kind of enthusiasm for the things of God if we are saved? This is a difference that should show up in our life. And here's the big one. The D, decisions. Listen, before you know Christ, you make decisions like everybody else. How much does it cost? How much money do I have? What are my friends doing? What does my family say? How do I feel? How do I look when I do that? All those things, that's what we use to make decisions in our lives. After Christ, it should be different. What does God's Word say about it? Let me pray about it. What is it that would honor and glorify God with this decision? What is it that would bring discipline in my life and bring me closer to God with this decision? Totally different way. <clears throat> I'm not sure where everyone is. Now, some of you I know better than others. But only you know what's in your heart. So I'm going to take us to the time of invitation right now. And in just a moment, I'm going to pray for us. And after that, we will open up this invitation. And this is what I want you to consider. Where are you on this journey? Do you say, you know, honestly, I don't think I've ever said anything. I've never actually confessed it. Today is the day that you can take care of your eternity forever. Right here, right now. Maybe you said, well, I, honestly, I, I'm, I've said it, I've confessed it, but I'm not sure I'm reflecting it in my life. There's some things i got to work on. Well, you don't have to confess those to me. But you can agree with God or deny God. This altar is a great place to start saying, God, I need help to work on it. Some of it's easy. We just need to start saying no more. We know that. But some of it's not that easy. It is a work. And God said, listen. I'm walking with you through this. I'm not just going to throw you out. 
But there's a point where we start by saying, yes, Lord. And some of you, honestly, you are walking with God and you are on this bus and you're just thinking, I'm just waiting for it to get there. Praise God for the day it happens. But I would ask you to start praying for those other people around you. And start looking for people that are literally going to be left behind when this bus arrives on that day. Start being concerned for others. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace, for dying for us at the cross of Calvary. And Father, thank you that while there's so many things going on in the world, the truth is there, you made it simple. There's one way. It was not to be exclusive, but it was to be simple and effective. And that's exactly what you did. You came and you walked among us and you died in our place at the cross. You took our grave to show us that it's temporary. And then you walked among us afterwards to show us the hope that we have in you. And Father, you have left us here as a witness for that life. Father, I pray for every life here right now, for every person listening now or later. Father, that we would know for certain and for sure that we are saved and that we are yours for eternity. Thank you again for your love and your grace, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we stand and sing, this altar is open for whatever you need. Um, I'm here to talk with you. We can talk now or we can talk later if you want to set a time. Whatever your needs are, whatever you have, this altar is a great place to take it. Join us as we sing.
Yes. Uh, out here in the foyer, uh, Miss Buddy has put uh, the prayer guides for you. You can pray for Frost. You can pray for any school district that you live in, whatever. It doesn't matter. Uh, they all need prayer, I can promise you. But she has six more weeks of prayer, guys, so we'd love to have you guys join us in that as well. You can do it at your home. You can do it wherever. Um, yes, sir, Dr. John. There's the uh, Texas Baptist Men's Shower Unit is working today in Wapatachi. Oh, yes. The Bible Church for the homeless. Oh, okay. And you can hear that and all that kind of stuff. I'm on there to see what we're talking about. Thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, God said you do it for the least of these, my brothers. So, uh, Texas Baptist men, um, been a part of a ministry I mentioned uh, last week, part of the things that we support and we're a part of. Uh, so, we'll be praying for them. And uh, you're going to hear more about more opportunities, too. I can promise you that. We're going to get those in front of you so you know other places to join a ministry, not just in the walls of this church, but anywhere in the world. So, all right. All right thank you for that.